It's Gamescom again, which means so much more Battle Lord gameplay, news, and trying to work out what they're saying in German. But of course, we already had the really exciting news of Early Access coming in March 2020. But we have much, many more, many wows, many calls, new gameplay. Over the next few days, I'll be bringing you tons of videos on each bit of gameplay that's getting released. So subscribe and put on notifications if you haven't already to see it as soon as it comes out. But as today is the first, let's start with our first bit of field battle gameplay. As the cavalry take to the scene with men and bows ready to unleash upon the enemy, let's join in on Borogmir. As mentioned previously, Gamescom lets players take control of three pre-made characters. One in which is Borogmir, with the first bit of gameplay and interview by GameStar is from this point of view. Unfortunately it was all in German, so there might be bits of information that I haven't been able to put in this video because I'm a stupid Brit and I can only make out a few things. But nonetheless, here's what we can take from the gameplay and the videos of the first battle. Let's talk about army size. We'll have a whole video tomorrow looking into exactly how big we can get the battles in Banlord, but they look huge. You can just see the vast amount of troops spawning in, and this is just one side. Of course, battles, most of the time, have two people fighting each other, unless you're my dog who has a multiple personality disorder. But just being able to see the amount of troops getting on the battlefield, where it be infantry, archers, cavalry, and even on some point when we look into the sieges, siege weaponry as well. Well, as I said, I'm going to be going through and trying to work out exactly the sheer amount that you can get on the battlefield from the gameplay videos that we're going to get over the last few days. So that will come out tomorrow and I'll do a little bit of Spirit of the Law maths in there just to try and work out because that's probably one of the biggest questions people really want to know at this point. But moving on from army size, what about the maps? I mean, the maps need to cater to the armies and of course they'll be bigger than Warband because there's much bigger armies. But as we can see in the map size from this gameplay, it looks so much bigger. It stretches out further than you can see. And looking from the spawn, you can just see mountains, rocks, hills and everything, flat battlelands and even the water. You might be thinking, yeah, but you can't get to any of that. Well, whilst the thing's off way in the distance, probably you can't. Later on, the player actually rides through those rocks that you can see over in the distance from spawn, which is clear that you can actually get to most of the places that you can really see in your not so far distance from the spawn. Hopefully we will be able to see these bigger maps when it goes on to the sieges as I'll bring you that gameplay very soon. But the scenery is gorgeous. It seems to have much more variety than we got in Warband. Instead of just being a grassy flatland, a desert or even a forest, we have so much more that we can feast our eyes on. Having patches of trees that you're going to be able to hide troops in, having these open plains that will make cavalry so superior, and of course hills and rocky areas that will put archers up there for superiority. But also being able to see the rivers and the lakes around, the mountains in the background, the attention to details on even bits that you can't get to is so much greater than what we had in Warband. Now, there's a hot button where you're able to press and see how many men the enemy have and where they are on the battlefield. You're also able to see what unit they're playing as, whether it's cavalry, archers, spearmen, and so on, making it really helpful for planning out before your attack. This will be great for if you have a cavalry contingent and you want them to flank the enemy. You're going to be able to see if that infantry unit that you're attacking is an archer or a spearman, because that could be the decision between life and death. Being able to flank around with your cavalry, but, but also with infantry, being able to see where their cavalry is, but at the same time, having that sort of realism where you're down as a general, so it's only going to be stuff that you can see, you're not going to have that total war overhead map, so you're going to have to try and work out the right orders, the right strategy to do from what you can see as a player on the ground with the rest of your men, and that's what makes the Mountain Blade franchise so unique to other franchises. On the left, we can see the options that you have in the game when you're commanding your battles. Movement, which of course will be where you move your men to, bringing up a little flag and being able to send them to that area. Now we haven't seen any information about in Warband where you can press the function keys and you can make people follow you. That doesn't seem to be in Banlord, or at least from not what we've seen. So they're going with the flag orders, which is great because it means that you don't actually have to be in their place for them to hold, hold the position. You can almost shout at them and tell them to go there whilst you're moving with someone else and giving them formation orders. You can also see where you're facing. You can decide which way your troops will be facing and this can be so crucial 
people in battle. Of course, facing the enemy is the best option, but what if you've been flanked? What if your front line is in melee and your supporting units at the back are ready to get in and help them? All of a sudden you hear a horn blow and the enemy cavalry comes out from the forest behind you. They have flanked you and you've not been able to see it. While turning that back line round as quick as possible is crucial. So having this facing command and using it correctly is a great little addition to micromanaging, not only supporting their movements, but also the position that they're holding as well, making sure that they're doing exactly what they need to be doing. Additionally to this, you have the form, the formations that your troops are in, whether this is a square, a shield wall, a more spaced formation. These can cater to not only the troops that you have, but also the situations you're in. You're going to be wanting to have a very strong shield wall with spearmen and very loose spacing with your archers, especially if they're coming down and against from other enemy archers, making them a bit harder to hit. This can also be great for changing your infantry formations as well. When sieging a castle, you don't want to be tightly packed, as at the beginning of the castle when you're walking up to the walls push, pushing battering rams siege towers and so on you're going to be very vulnerable to artillery and missile fire so making your troops more spaced out is going to be extremely important furthermore we have the fire command choosing whether you fire will or they hold their fire Looking more onto the left side, we can see the command, which is more of the sort of the flag basement. You can tell someone to go somewhere as addition to the follow me commands that we can see right at the top. And finally, transfer. Now, this is an interesting one because there's nothing specifically telling us what this means. My prediction, though, is it's to do with transferring troops or your army to certain lords or AI throughout your game. We have heard that when you go into Mountain Blade 2 Battlelord, you're not going to be the only lord on the battlefield. Maybe at the beginning, but as you grow and get reputation and grow your armies, you're going to want other people to help you command your men. An AI Lord might be commanding the archers or the infantry while you take the cavalry on. This means that you're able to split up roles, or even on the other hand, an AI Lord or an AI King might enlist you into their army and make you command a detachment while they are the overall general. I'm assuming this transfer command is talking about maybe one of your generals, Trevor over there, has got the archers. But he is doing a great job. But maybe you're with the cavalry and you're having a tricky time of it. This means the infantry that you are supposed to command in the middle has been left untouched because you're too busy focusing on the cavalry and trying to not get them killed. So transferring that infantry unit over to Trevor with his archers might be the best option since him with those two working together might be better than the cavalry and the infantry working together. These are some situations that you might need to use this transfer command in throughout the battle. Furthermore, going to the command option, when you're ordering troops a flag of course comes up but also you can see arrows at the bottom being able to see where each troop will stand making it easier to form formations throughout the battle and also linking into the facing and you're going to be able to see exactly where they're going maybe in the midst of battle this is going to be important but i would put it to you that it's more important at the beginning of battle when you're trying to come up with these elite formations maybe you see that the enemy has got way more archers so you're going to have to play it very aggressive or maybe you see it that the enemy has got way more men than you but you have more balanced men maybe you've got quite a few infantry a ton of archers and not much cavalry this means that you're probably going to have to play it more defensively so setting up defensive walls and formations and maybe if you're that 13 year old american kid you might want to set up a noob square if that comes to it at the very top of the screen we can see the battle balance i'm assuming this seems similar to the total war style where you're able to keep an overview of how the battle is going in general in terms of numbers it won't give you specifically on what's going on and of course it won't 100% be accurate whether or not it takes in morale whether it takes in the abilities and the actual level of the troops rather than just numbers that's something that we're going to have to find out sooner or later Now the AI seems way more turned on than it did in Warband, marching up in formations with infantry in the middle and cavalry on the flanks. They seem to be doing a lot more in terms of taking orders and as we saw last Gamescom, they actually do things when they're at disadvantages that you wouldn't expect. Instead of just standing in one place like they did in Warband when they're at the disadvantage, they actually will find a hill. They'll find terrain to help them and suit their needs depending on their army and how they think they best want to win. The AI purposely wants to win this battle, whereas in Warband, the AI supposedly would want to win this battle, but they wouldn't exactly help themselves, especially if they had way more men than you, they'd just charge straight at you, and it would be a bit of a cluster, and you'd completely just slaughter them, because they'd have just cavalry charging into your spears, infantry charging into your other infantry, and archers just getting picked off one by one. Now, the reinforcements mechanic is still in the game, as we can see. There are a lot more men on the battlefield, as I mentioned earlier, but there's still 
still room for more men coming through as reinforcements. As you start slaughtering the enemy or as they start slaughtering you, if you actually have more men in reserve, they'll then be brought into the battle. Perhaps there'll be a number slider like in Warband to how many men you can actually get in the battle and this will just be the extras. But just as there's way more men on the battlefield, you'll probably be able to bring in more in reinforcements as well. And as we were told before, we can see the enemies being picked off by cavalry, seeing the morale mechanic in action, as we were told about before. As the men are being slaughtered, they start to lose faith in their lord, they start to lose faith that they might win this battle, and they think it's not worth it anymore. So they turn their backs and run, but in doing so make them so much more vulnerable to not only archers picking them off from afar, but also the cavalry coming up behind. And talking about chasing people and coming up behind, we can see after the battle is being won and the player's team is really getting there and they are starting to take out all the enemy, they are chasing them down by cavalry, doing what they can to pick them off and as we can see, moving into the rocky areas that were further on the battle that we saw at the beginning that really it didn't look like you get going, but this is really what made me see how big these maps really are. But that's pretty much it for this first bit of gameplay for Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord. Make sure to subscribe and hit the like button if you want to see way more of this. I'll be bringing probably one more bit of Siege gameplay today. And then I think we've got two or three more bits of gameplay that will come through the next few days. But thank you so much for watching, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you follow me on Twitter for the news as soon as it comes out. And of course, join the Steam group linked in the description because I post an announcement there as soon as I upload a video. But if you haven't already, turn on notifications. And until then, I will see you in the next one.